Oh, there you go. Okay, now I can see. All right, now we're good. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we are presenting on supporting Latine and biracial students at community colleges using uh, cultural wealth lens. My name is Jessica Ramirez. I use she, her, a pronouns. I currently serve as the Associate Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at Tacoma Community College. I am a product of the CTC system, and you'll hear more about my story within the presentation. And I have the pro pro pleasure and honor to do this presentation um, with Rick, and I will let him introduce himself. Hello, everybody. My name is Rick Flores. I use he, him, el pronouns. I'm the Director of Student Equity and Inclusion Services over at Skagit Valley College in Mount Vernon, Washington. And I'm a product of the California Community College system. Really excited to be presenting this information with Jessica and for you all to have as a resource. All right. Um, so first things first is our agenda. And we're gonna start with a land and labor acknowledgement, then go over expectations. Jess and I will share our stories. We'll talk cultural wealth. We'll talk experiences of Latina students in our colleges and experiences of biracial students. And then we will let y'all know some info to send us some questions and share some tools. Well, first we wanted to start with our land acknowledgement. Um, and so the State Board of Community and Technical College acknowledges that our community resides on the ancestral lands of the First Peoples. The office of the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges is located in Olympia on the Coast Salish lands of the Nisqually, Cowlitz, and Sequin. Sorry for the mispronunciation, peoples. You, we ask you to join us in celebrating the indigenous tribes of Washington by acknowledging the ancestral lands, indigenous communities, elders, the past, present, and future generations of the native peoples across our good state. All right, and I have the, the labor acknowledgement. We also acknowledge that our nation and our institutions have benefited and profited from the free enslaved labor of black people. We recognize the entangled and interconnected histories of indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from their land and the plight of the black people who were forcibly brought to it. We acknowledge the enduring impacts of the African diaspora and lift up the contributions, talents, and dreams of black communities. Importantly, we also acknowledge the immigrant and refugee labor that has contributed to the building of this country within our labor force, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked and undocumented peoples. We recognize and honor their important contributions to our state and to this nation. Here are the expectations that we have that, uh, towards the end of this presentation, that this session that will help attendees learn about the complexities of identity development in Latine and biracial community college students. This session will help attendees understand the differences between monoracial and multiracial experiences in identity development. And lastly, attendees will leave this session with tools to support the identity development of Latine and biracial community college students. All right, a little bit about, my, about myself. Um, my, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Jessica Ramirez. I use she, her, a pronouns. I'm a first generation eldest daughter of me a Mexican immigrant parents. Um, my dad is one of nine and my mom is one of 10. So between both of them, I have about 50 first cousins and it's one of the best blessings I've ever had in my life. Um, as we go through cultural wealth, you'll learn that familial capital will be my favorite capital because um, here you'll see my family present in the photos. I love to honor them um, and show them off because without them, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, uh, in the bottom right corner, you'll see a photo of four folks um, we're all in color coordinated outfits of all of between olive green and some tan colors outside. Um, and then in the top right, you'll see me and my sister. Uh, we are 13 years apart. Uh, I, when I mean the eldest, I truly mean that. Um, and I was also a parentified child and that has a lot to do with my own story as well and my experience. Um, I am the first in my immediate family to have uh, received a high school diploma 
um, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, and a master's degree. Um, I don't take that lightly. I know that I have done this not only for myself, but for my family who has wanted me to achieve these uh, dreams and career aspirations that I've had. Um, I received my master's degree in 2020 um, in the height of the pandemic. I was in the process of both learning how to work from home and learning how to finish a capstone project in the middle of all that. Um, it was a lot to endure. Um, I attended Centralia College from 2009 to 2011. Um, I was really, I was a really active student. I was on the activities and missions team at that time. So that student group was in charge of all the campus activities and they were also ambassadors and helped with campus tours. I really enjoyed um, my involvement with that. I was a classic case of like, I don't know what I wanna do when I grow up. I, for the longest time, thought I wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, and then math and science were not my friends. Reflecting now, I realize it's uh, the barriers that we put against women, especially women of color who are trying to pursue STEM careers. Um, I just had that epiphany actually not that long ago. Um, but through that process of being involved, my advisors were like, you know, you can do this as a full-time profession. And I was like, what? no way and so i was just like well what did you guys get your uh um bachelor's degrees and then one of them was like communication studies so i was like that's what i'm gonna do um and through that i then transferred to western washington university um i i uh took the intro class to communication studies and then i took the intro class to human services because i still wasn't completely sure if i wanted to go into higher ed or not um but i realized with the human services industry, I was no longer gonna be able to uh, have relationships with those folks. And I knew in higher ed that you could still keep in contact with the, your previous advisors. And then, um, so I went through the communication study route and then I learned that I needed to have a minor. And at that time I took um, diversity in higher education. And that's when I took American comparative culture studies. And through that, I also realized I had a really big passion for equity, diversity, and inclusion work. I was finally able to find terminology to a lot of the experiences that I had as a Latina woman in a very conservative rural area. Um, and then I was like, no, I'm gonna go into law. I'm gonna like, I, immigration has impacted my family a lot. I was like, that's what I wanna do. That's who I'm gonna be. Um, and my advisors back at Central College were like, are you sure? Like, I just don't know. Like, I support you no matter what, but I just really feel like you're meant to work in higher ed. And I was like, no. Um, and then through my um, program, I had to do a um, internship. So I chose to work with the Ethnic Student Center at Western. And then we did a lot of programming that like did focus on our students of color and all LGBTQ plus students. Um, and so through that process, I realized and made that connection that I could do, can, tie my passion of uh, EDI work um, and working with students all into one. So I was very lucky that my uh, advisor was about to transition to a different CTC school and that position was gonna open up in student life. Um, I was applying for this job before I technically even had my bachelor's degree. Um, and so I was very blessed and got the job um, and I worked there for eight years and then I transitioned into uh, this role at TCC doing EDI work full time. Um, I took time to get my master's degree to really decide if I wanted to do one in higher ed and I did and I am so glad that I did. I am a student affairs professional at heart. I truly believe that there's so many support systems that we can have and have EDI lens to support our students to navigate the classroom and everything else on campus. Um, and so that's a little bit about my story and I'll share more tidbits here and there as we go through the presentation. But um, going to Centralia College and being a CTC product is like the biggest blessing I think that I have. I owe that experience to my career and my trajectory now. Um, and so I've had also the privilege to hear other students say that their time at a CC was the biggest influence that they had. And so I'm just such a big, like, pusher of like go to a community and college to other students. So I'm really excited that I can share knowledge of my own experience and how we can support other Latine identifying students to go through the system. Awesome. Thanks, Jess, for sharing your story with us. All righty. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about me. 
So I mentioned I'm a California community college product. So I'm from San Ysidro, California, which is right on the US-Mexico border. And actually here in the top right, you will see a photo and there is a beach with a fence going all the way from the ocean into the hills behind it. On the left side of the fence is South San Diego County and on the right side is Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico. So I grew up right on the border as a resident of two nations, bouncing between both San Diego and San Isidro in South San Diego County and Tijuana, Mexico, depending on how family finances were. My dad's from Mexico, from Jalisco. My mom's American from California. And so I grew up not only as a biracial person, my mother's white, my father's Mexican, but also a binational resident bouncing between two countries because of low income. Um, my high school was 90% Latinx. It was a Title I um, high school. Um, we, but although we were considered like low performing, we had one of the highest rates of Latinx students passing AP exams in the country. Um, so that was something that was pretty cool. And when I was in high school, people told me that college wasn't going to be for me, that I should just go work construction or go work the Navy shipyards or join the military or any other things that uh, people like me didn't do well in college. Um, but I'm a really stubborn individual. And so I went to college anyway. And I went to Southwestern College. Um, it is a community college in Chula Vista, California, part of the California Community College System. Um, it is a Hispanic serving institution. So um, lots of Latina folks there, lots of really cool professionals. And I think, um, it was really impactful for me to go to a community college first. I tell people I am a two-time community college dropout. I didn't know what I was doing when I was going through college. Um, first gen student, my parents had no clue what FAFSA was. Um, I, you know, I had them sit next to me on a computer while we fumbled through the application because my high school counselors told me that there was no point in me filling it out because they didn't think I was gonna go to college anyway. And, <clears throat> you know, I went and did the thing and got academically dismissed my first year, took a little time off, went back, got academically dismissed again, and then went back and finished. So it took me about four years to finish a two-year degree. And after I finished at Southwestern College, I transferred to Washington State University Pullman, um, which is 1,200 miles away and going from the beach town to uh, hundreds of miles of wheat fields in Eastern Washington was a life-changing experience. Um, originally, when I was in community college, I was studying history, I was studying um, communications, and I decided to switch over to music. So here in the center, you'll see a photo of me. It's myself in a red and white marching band uniform with a anthracite gray hat holding a silver trumpet while wearing white gloves. Uh, music something that's very important to me. I've been a musician almost my entire life since I was like five, six years old. So about 25 years I've been doing music. And when I went to Wazoo, I switched to being a music major and also still kept studying history because I knew doing only music wasn't going to pay the bills. Um, it's a joke all of us musicians have. And I struggled at Wazoo because that school is primarily white. It was the first time in my life I felt like a minority and I was 1,200 miles away from home. While I was at Wazoo though, I got involved like every good student affairs professional did during their undergrad. I got heavily involved in student activities. So besides marching band, if you look here to the bottom in the bottom right corner, um, I have a photo of myself wearing a navy blue coach's jacket. It is my fraternity jacket with the Greek letters Gamma Iota Omicron to stand for Gamma Iota Omicron Fraternity Incorporated. It is a multicultural fraternity that was based and founded at Washington State University. And outside of marching band, it was the first place I found that was home at Wazoo because I had a bunch of fraternity brothers who were brown like me, who were first gen, child of immigrants. And it was just a really empowering and affirming space. And that was the catalyst for how I even got into student affairs. Because after I joined my fraternity, I got a chapter leadership position, which led to me being president and getting elected to president of my Greek council. 
which got me on the services and activities committee, all these student affairs work groups and everything because they wanted more students of color involved. And our vice president of student affairs, Dr. Mary Jo Gonzalez, reached out to me and asked if this was the kind of work I wanted to do. If I wanted to be in these spaces advocating for students that looked like me for my professional job. And I was like, it's gotta pay more than being a gigging musician, so why not? And from there I got involved with NASPA as an undergraduate fellow and decided that this was the work I wanted to do. So when I graduated from Wazoo, I got a job in the Division of Student Affairs as an interim retention counselor in the Chicanx Latinx Center and started going to grad school online through Arkansas State University. So I graduated Wazoo 2019, BA, Humanities and Music, because I realized I didn't want to finish out my music degree because I wanted to work in student affairs. Started working at Wazoo right after I graduated. Started grad school in January 2020. In March of 2020, the world fell apart, but my master's program was 100% online. But another thing that happened in March is I got my first full-time salaried position, a permanent salaried position at Skagit Valley College as the student life specialist. And I really enjoyed it. I loved student activities, loved helping plan events. And while I was, I was at Skagit Valley College in that student life role, I had an opportunity to lead the student equity and inclusion office during a staff vacancy. And I guess I did a good enough job on the interim that they gave me the job permanently. Um, which was awesome. It gave a lot of opportunity for me to support my family more. Um, I have a slide here, a picture here on my slide on the left. It's a photo of myself and my wife. Um, my wife is also a musician. We both met in marching band in college, and we play in the Rain City Riot, which is the pep band for the OL Rain, who are now rebranded as the Seattle Rain FC. And in the middle is our daughter Esperanza, who comes with us every now and then. Um, so being getting this you know advancement into a director role gave me a little more financial stability to support my family i mean give me a lot of opportunity but one of the biggest things i got proud of was this picture i have here in the middle bottom this is me the first time i got to wear my master's regalia in person and it was at commencement in spring of 2022 at skagit valley college where i got to put on my cap and gown that i hadn't even worn yet for my master's degree uh, to wear at commencement to congratulate all of our students graduating from SVC. So it's it's come it's come around. I went from the kid who was told college, college wasn't for him and I went to a community college and flicked out to now I'm a master's degree holder at a community college supporting students like me. All Thank right. you Rick for sharing your story with all of us. All right, we are now gonna talk about experiences of Latina students that happen. Um, the first one being, and I think this is the best first disclaimer, is that we are not all monolithic people. All of us have way different experiences. Um, we're not, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, and then the next one being language development, making assumptions. And when we say that in the sense of like, not all of us are Spanish speakers. Some of us grew up without speaking Spanish and there's a lot of history in that as well. And like in short, um, it's for survival. And some of some parents didn't want their children to have that accent, to, have, to face that kind of discrimination. Um, and so the, also saying that in the sense it, that doesn't mean you are less than or not as Latin as other folks who are Spanish speakers. And we also have to deal with machista culture. There's this whole sense of toxic masculinity that takes place in our culture. And we have to continuously disrupt that and show, especially, you know, uh, male identifying Latina folks that it's okay to show emotion. It's okay to have those emotions and process through them. Um, and we also have to analyze the intersection of citizenship status, that we have a broad range of citizenship status among the Latina population of our students. We have everyone who, you know, U.S. citizens, permanent residents, asylees, um, undocumented individuals, DACA-mented, people with DACA. And so we, we have to really be careful about the way we're classifying all these students and understand that 
it, everyone is coming at this from a different place. And then the next thing is we're not all Mexican. Um, being on the West Coast, that is the biggest assumption of Latina folks is that we're all Mexican. And that is definitely not the case, especially with the amount of students we have coming from places like Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador with the continued destabilization of Central America. Yeah, and I would add to that, uh, even within myself growing up, I it took me until like my late teens to realize that not everyone was Mexican because there is a huge population of Mexican folks who did migrate into like certain parts of Washington. Um, but yeah, keeping in mind that we are serving a wide range of folks and connecting that with colorism, that, all, that we are a wide spectrum of colors, um, an incredibly light-skinned Latina, um, I would say Rick is darker than I am, um, and he's more considered more brown. And so I also have an aunt who's very like white passing. Um, all she's missing is colored eyes, and people would probably assume that she is white. And I have also have an uncle who's incredibly brown and could probably pass as black. And so um, depending on our skin tone, some of us are treated differently based off that. And so just that there's a spectrum in that color as well. Um, and then there's a deficiency mindset played upon us. Some of there's this like assumption that we're not smart or that we're not capable or that, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and sometimes that's just already put upon us. And I think Rick alluded that really well, just with his experience of like, why are you even applying for college? Like maybe sh you should just go into a trades um, and all those, those things as well. Yeah. And our Latina students are facing all these things in different degrees as well. Some of them are facing all of them. Some of them are only facing a few. Some aren't facing anything because they might be third, fourth generation here in the United States. But it's important to name these experiences as our students are facing them every day in different volumes. Now we're gonna talk about the experiences of biracial students. So myself being a biracial individual, it's been interesting talking with biracial students hearing about everything that's going on. You might hear my daughter in the background. So I'm at home. We all know how that is. Um, so people make assumptions about you based on someone's physical appearance. A lot of my friends, when I tell them I'm half white, they're a little surprised until they see my middle name or they see my mother. Um, but, you know, there there's a lot of um, ethnically ambiguous folks as well that you can't tell if they're mixed race or not. And there's a lot of folks who might look monoracial, but are in fact biracial or multiracial individuals. And then because of the biraciality of a lot of students, their identities get invalidated. There's, you know, there's no such thing as being mixed. They have to pick one or the other. Um, and so people tell them, oh, you're, you're not Mexican because you're half white. You know, that's, that's something I was told a lot growing up is I'm not Latino, I'm not Mexican because I'm half white. Um, and uh, there's a lot of biracial, multiracial folks that also are monolingual. So I've met a, a lot of my biracial students are monolingual. They don't speak Spanish or they don't speak um, any other language than English. And so people from their own communities shun them for not speaking these different languages. And then being multiracial in a monoracial world, world can impact their mental health because again, we look at race and ethnicity in such a monotone way and narrow way that people get forced to either conform or be away from their identities. And that is going to lead to a rise in depression. That's going to lead to a rise in anxiety. All these different conditions that are going to, you know, severely impact these students and that we see the rise of every day, especially being exacerbated by the pandemic. And then oftentimes biracial and multiracial folks are objectified as exotic. You know, folks, there are people out there who think that mixed race people, they're like, oh, I need to have a mixed race baby or I need to have a mix a partner so I could have a mixed race family. And that objectification of mixed race folks is very harmful because now we're being looked at as objects instead of as people. And then our experiences and identities are um, pathologized 
they're seen as abnormal. They're not seen as a regularly occurring thing. You know, we can't possibly have normal experiences because we're mixed. You know, I get told all the time that I don't know what it's like growing up Latino because I'm half white and I'm like, y'all, I was still woken up on Saturday mornings with cumbias and other cleaning music to get my butt out of bed and cleaning while chiles were roasting on the pan and I was choking up on that smoke or I was, you know, doing the carne asada with the family every week. All these things, being sleeping on a chair at a party, all these experiences I have that a lot of people will claim that I don't know what it's like to be a member of the Latina community because I'm half white. I love Esperanza in the background, honestly. It reminds me why I do this work, honestly. Um, so in my program, they asked us as practitioners, what kind of lens and theories are we going to use? Um, and I've always been one of like critical race theory, um, feminist theory, um, and intersectionality. And something that I really enjoyed in that program with my advisors was the work of Tara Yoso. And she t uh, derives this from critical race theory. Um, and so she, Yoso defines this community cultural wealth as an array of knowledge, skills, abilities, and contexts possessed and used by communities of color to survive and resist racism and other forms of oppression. Um, when I read this, it was one of the like so empowering. Um, we, as people of color, do need to talk about the racism that we face and all other types of form of oppression. But I think it's also important to acknowledge the strengths and the wealth that we bring into the spaces that we enter. Um, and so when I heard about this, I now make sure I share with everybody about cultural wealth and how we can use that. And so specifically here, um, we want to use it within the lens of supporting our Latin and biracial students. Um, and so as we go through each of the capitals, um, we'll go into that um, more. So the first one being aspirational capital, essentially it's the ability to maintain hopes and dreams for the future despite the barriers that are faced. It's resiliency and allowing yourself to dream of possibilities beyond their present circumstances. And then it's aspiration of education, a space of financial mobility despite the barriers. As I, uh, as I mentioned and Rick has mentioned, we are both first generation students. Um, statistically, we're, we aren't meant to have these degrees that we do have and it's a privilege to have those um and so i i've aspired to have these many degrees still up in the air about that doctorate you know one degree at a time is usually my motto but we will see um but i also think just going to college is an aspiration for our students um some students depending on their family dynamics um i've seen it be pretty binary in the sense of like some Latina families are very supportive of their students going to college and then the others are like no like why are you going to college you should just go straight into the workforce and not have that understanding um, and so I've, I've had that experience with both of my students so then being in the classroom I think is an aspiration and then have, having a seat in the classroom especially if they are within the first generation identifying Sense. So I always like to remind my students of that and just help them achieve their goals and dreams. Um, a lot of times when I have this conversation with students, it's just to get a degree, the ability to make money, to support their families. A lot of it's back and tying into their families. And so what are their ho what hopes and dreams motivate you as a person, as a professional? And how can we remember that for our students? Like, what are their goals and dreams? Like, why are they in your classroom? Why are they taking your class? Um, because not everyone has that privilege and luxury to go to college. Um, and so I that, for me, aspirations are so important for our students to be in, in the spaces that they are, um, especially if they are at your college. All right, so next we're going to talk about familial capital, which is something that a lot of communities of color have in common with each other. Um, so this is referring to cultural knowledges that are nurtured among familia or kin that carry a sense of community history and memory and cultural intuition. So this is um, all these things that are passed down from family to family. These are the things your abuela passed to your parents that, you, that are passed to you, that are things I'm going to pass down to my daughter as she gets older. Um, 
this is also our commitment to our community's well-being and that it's not just about our nuclear family. You know, this is about our community as a whole and understanding that everybody's your tío or tía, right? Like we all have those tíos and tías that aren't related to us, but are still part of our family. And, you know, it hits on the next point, you know, your prima, your prima, your premix, these people who aren't blood related to you, but are, are your familia. And also understanding that we need to maintain a healthy connection to our community and its resources in order for us to feel that sense of belonging and inclusivity. And I think this is something that we can help nurture on our campuses by creating spaces for our students to have that sense. That's your student organizations. That is your cultural heritage month programming. That is your, you know, professionals of color being available to talk to students. That is your campuses being open to families being on that campus, children coming on with their parents to class when they need to and things like that. But also this conscientiousness can be fostered within and between families through again, things like sports or school, community colleges, we're part of that, religious gatherings or other social community settings. You know, and one thing we always have to think about is what does this support look like at home? What are ways that we are connecting with students and their families? Because one thing one of my mentors and other folks have always said is when we're bringing students into our campus, we're not only bringing the students, we're bringing their families as well to be part of our campus communities. Yeah, and I, the things that I would add here is like, if you are working with uh, in student affairs or campus programming, are your programs open for just, for students and their families and not just like in that traditional sense of their parents, but also the students who are non-traditional and have children, can they bring their children to these events? Um, are you willing to take care of someone's child if they have a test and they can't find that child care, right? Um, what does your graduation ceremonies look like? I know during the pandemic, there was this concern of only four people could come to graduation ceremonies. And I was like, well, that's not inclusive of those who have big families or their extended family members are to them, their immediate close-knit family members. How are we extending those numbers and are we being conscious of those things? Um, I know personally, I would love to see more graduations if it's like even in smaller formats where people can bring their parents or have them close on stage because their familia means so much to them. Um, I'm incredibly biased. This is my favorite capital. I'm very blessed with the community that I've created. And as someone who is in the eldest, because I have had the privileges of navigating higher ed, like I also am the one person who brings a lot of the information that I have learned to my family members. Um, and depending on students, uh, if their parents don't have, if they don't know how the system works, it's really hard for students to be able to go home to share this information with them. And so sometimes they just need that extra support and encouragement that they're on the right trajectory of like uh, getting an education. Linguistic capital, all right. Sometimes I like to say I don't speak Spanish or English. Sometimes I speak Spanglish and sometimes I don't speak any of them. <laughs> um, but this aspect of cultural wealth learns from over 35 years of research about the value of bilingual education and emphasizes the connections between racialized cultural history and language. Um, linguistic capital reflects the idea that students of color arrive at school with multiple language and communication skills. Um, again, storytelling traditions and then a lot of other communities colors as well, there's listening to and recounting oral history stories in the proverbs. And it's the repertoire of storytelling uh, skills, including memorization, attention to detail, dramatic pauses, comedic timing, facial affect, vocal tone, volume, rhythm, and rhyme. Um, so a couple pieces that I would add here is someone who grew up as a Spanish speaker and then had to assimilate to our education system. I had to go to ESL the first three from kindergarten to third grade. That's essentially when I knew I was different. I knew that I was not the same as my peers. Um, I, I had some shame as I got older because I didn't like being taken out of the classroom to learn how to speak uh, better English. Um, one of the questions that they asked me of like, oh, what do you eat your food with? And I was like, tortillas. And they were like, no, you're wrong. 
And I was like, what do you mean I'm wrong? Like, that's how I eat my food. But they were referring to utensils like a fork, spoon, and knife. Um, and so then I was like, oh, okay, like I'm not the same as everybody else. So at a very young age, I knew that I identified within a different identity group as the majority did. Um, I, in college, took communications for teachers and our service, we had a service learning component to that. And one, a, a very healing moment for me was that I got to work at an after school program uh, for bilingual students and they were to keep practicing their Spanish. So in this space, we were only allowed to speak Spanish. We practiced um, reading in Spanish and played games in Spanish and did recess things outside all in Spanish. And my little, um, student was his name was diego and i just remember like connecting with him and just like feeling like such a healing moment that he was in a space where it was like after school and that he got to still practice his spanish um and just seeing a whole bunch of other students be able to continue to practice their spanish and so that for me is huge and i love to see how we progress to now in the k-12 through system and how can we translate some of that into the higher ed system um, another thing that I like to know out here, note here is like sarcasm is a form of linguistic capital. I don't think people realize that that's a skill set and not everyone can read that. And also being mindful of ASL and other uh, sign languages that exist in the world. I think that's also very important to capture and then how neurodivergent um, gestures and tendencies can also play within uh, linguistic capital and so keeping those things in mind as well and so questions here that i like to ask professionals as on staff are like what are the languages and communication communication skills that your students are bringing into campus do you have multilingual students in your classroom are there ways that you can provide your work in multiple languages um what are your pamphlets that you're using brochures like when you're sending campus-wide messaging, like what does that look like? What are, you know, um, th th there's a lot of things to consider there. Um, one of the things that I'm tr strongly trying to encourage on our campus is um, having our website be available in multiple languages, especially the top ones that are being used. Um, and so just keeping those things in mind. All right, next up, we got that good old social capital. Um, so this is our networks of people and community resources. So it is about who you know and what you know, as far as people and community goes. So this is really helping our students find community on our campuses, getting them connected to clubs, resources, helping them understand what's in the community for resources. You know, like I, my college is in Mount Vernon, Washington, which huge Latinx community. And I know where every single Latine like grocery market is so I can tell students where they need to go because some of them are very much like, oh, well, this store has a bunch of stuff from Oaxaca. This store has a bunch of stuff from Michoacan. This stuff has Central American goods. So, help, you know, using that and helping students find out where they can go and find these things they need. Um, also, having peer and social contacts are instrumental and emotional support it provides that for our students and we our students need that to get through school these school systems were not designed with them in mind so this is a way to help them persist um, and like i said it's all about who you know what you know all that is equally as important in order to help communities of color thrive on our campuses and our students talk we know because we all talked when we were in college we know which people we can go to you know which staff members was good which staff members were bad which professors we could trust and students are going to share that information and we have to be willing to work with them on that um and understand that they are going to say whatever they're going to say and we're going to have to work with that um but one thing a couple things to really think about is what are the connections we're creating for these students like, are you creating a space that is safe and affirming for them to be their authentic selves? Is your campus creating opportunity for them? You know, who has access to internships, um, work study jobs, all these opportunities that could help students advance? Are those people equity minded and understand that communities of color need a little more support to accessing those? You know, are the students we're having do ex like these big equity-minded projects and task forces and committees, are they being compensated? 
you know, how are we looking at that? And, you know, it gets even bigger when you talk about undocumented students. What's that compensation looks like? Because we can't legally pay them an hourly wage. Well, what are ways we can compensate them? Scholarships is a good one. Um, and how are we making everything accessible? You know, are we still expecting folks to be 100% in person? Are we offering virtual meetings? Are we offering interpreters so that we can have students who speak languages other than, than English involved in what we do on campus? These are all aspects of social capital we have to consider when we want to serve bilingual, um, biracial and Latina students on our campuses, because it's not only about Spanish. We got indigenous languages. We have, you know, Brazilians speak Portuguese, as an example. We have to find interpreters to reach all these different populations on our campuses. Navigational capital. Um, so this one refers to the skills maneuvering through social institutions. Um, so here we're specifically talking about higher education, the community co technical college system. Um, historically, this infers the ability to maneuver through institutions that were not created for communities of color in mind. This is where I like to remind folks that higher education was made specifically for white men when it began. We've come a long way for that, from that, but we have still created a lot of barriers for our students of color. Um, Yoso further explains that students' navigational capital empowers them to maneuver within unsupportive or hostile environments. Um, and so here I think it's important to, to think about and start thinking of students before they're officially students, right? So it's like, as they open the college application, what does that look like? What does it look like filling out financial aid? What does it look like for them finding scholarships on campus? What does it look like for them to find any tutoring center on campus? Any other resources that might be available to them that sometimes they're often unaware of? Um, and so I think about my own experience as a, as a student, similar to what Rick said too, like I was like, I had a mom who was like, yes, I want you to go to college, like you're gonna go to college, but she didn't know what to do. She just knew she wanted to support me. And if it wasn't for someone who took their time to talk to me through that, that I would have never filled out the application. I would have never known how to fill out the financial aid form. It was because someone who looked similar to us and spoke Spanish, he was able to help me fill out the financial aid form only to find out we did not qualify. Don't get me started on what it means to be middle class. Um, but then, yeah, having those like systems. And then when you are an undecided student, like being assigned an advisor that um, helps with undecided students. But how do we make sure that these folks in advising do not have a certain bias and unconscious bias because of your identity that you are not meant to be in certain fields and they think that you should be in another ones and encouraging that instead of finding ways to maneuver, maneuver through those situations. And so, how are we supporting our students on campus? Is it easy, accessible to find? Are we doing one-stop shops? What does that really mean? What does that really look like? Um, where are we placing our student ambassadors? What does our enrollment services look like? What does entry services look like? Um, and so just being able to make things really clear and transparent um, as students apply for these scholarships or these programs um, and what those pieces even look like right within like I know that some of us have really competitive nursing programs or whatever it may be like are those also being used with an equity mind lens and things like that um, and so just keeping those things in mind as we move forward and, and in the classroom what does that look like are you someone who has a very strict like you have to be here at nine o'clock on the dot and then you lock the door um, like are we being mindful of things like life happens. So are we being mindful of those situations? And so um, I like to tell students that like they're more aware of what the resources are on campus and like sharing that information with others. So um, those are things that I ask you all to think about as you navigate your own institutions and your spaces that you are at. So resistance capital. Um, this has its foundations in the experiences of these communities in securing equal light, rights and collective freedom. So our students, our Latine students and our biracial, multiracial students are gonna have varying levels of experiences with this capital, especially depending where they're from. Um, I, a lot of my Latina students from Central America have a very different 
idea of what it means to secure equal rights and what it means to secure freedom than um, some of my students from Mexico and my multiracial biracial students here in America. But I also have multi-generational students who are third, fourth generation students that talk about, you know, their grandparents or great grandparents struggles in securing equal rights in the United States as well. Um, you know, according to Yoso, this, this source of capital is from their parents, from community members, and it's in the name of historical legacy of engaging in social justice. And students may not realize that they're engaging in social justice by trying to disrupt all these oppressive systems, but they are each and every day. You know, these students are able to engage in injustices and inequalities to make all your spaces a better place. If you notice, like, a lot of colleges were having a lot of struggle with campus climate while we were virtual. Like it was wild to hear that even though our students weren't on ground, there were so many campus climate issues. Why was that? Well, these students weren't around the professionals who were making the decisions, who were deciding what to do, and folks weren't informed on what our students' needs were in the most accurate way. We had communities of color who completely disengaged with our institutions because they didn't have access to internet. They didn't have access to computers. They didn't have access to all these resources they would typically have because they came and used it on campus. And in higher education, we didn't shift quickly enough or adequately enough to serve them. So as an institution, we have to learn like, how do we make sure that we are advocating for our students' rights? How are we making sure their voices are included in everything that we do? Our Latina and multiracial slash biracial students need to have a place at the table. You know, what are we doing to reach out to those communities to make sure that their identities are represented in campus student government? What are we doing in our shared governance structures to make sure that we have those students at the table? What are we doing with our programming to ensure that we are advocating for these identities to be educated about, to be represented in what we do? You know, and what are these students trying to do to advocate for themselves? Has, you know, I've caught myself many times like, well, I'm thinking about this. Why didn't I just go to this club meeting and ask the students myself instead of just trying to find resources online to tell me what the problem is or what the solution could be when I, when I have the resource right there on my own campus? You know, and then I have to think about that their, their backgrounds are all different their approach to resistance is different. So how can their upbringing um, dedicate this and decide how they go about resistance capital? Because I'll have students who are like, yeah, I feel wronged, but I'm scared to say something because they're worried about either their own immigration status or that of their families, or they're just worried about dealing with racism and hate. And then I got other students that are like, nah, throw me in the front. I don't care if I get picked up, let's do this. I'll catch a fade for whoever, you know, and we have to realize that students are in different places and we have to support them in whatever they want to do. Now, how can we create inclusive biracial, multiracial, and really also Latina spaces on our campuses? Because it applies to all these students that we're talking about. Um, so you already took step one by being part of this workshop and tuning in because you're making yourself aware of multiracial identities. That is that is a big part. There are a lot of folks who, like as I've learned, as I've taught more about multiracial and biracial identities, there are a lot of folks who just did not know how different the experiences can be for these individuals. Um, and then understand that multiracial folks have a choice in how they identify themselves separately than how you may identify them. Don't use fractions, don't use blood quantum or any measurement for identity. You know, although I'm biracial, I'm Latino. You can't tell me I'm not Latino, because I am. My last name's Flores, I eat frijoles, my dad's from Mexico, and I speak Spanish and all these other things, but those aren't the only things that make me Latino. It's who I am as a person. You know, use inclusive terminology. We want to make sure we're using gender neutral language when we can, you know, Latine, Latinx, you know, when we're talking about multiracial folks, those are your terms like Afro-Latine, Afro-Latinx, um, 
that you want to make sure we are using in order to keep these communities well represented and respected. And then we have to move on from hegemonic notions of identity. We're not all the same. We're not all going to fit your little box of what the government or institutions choose to define us as. And it's problematic to set a standard to be a part of our community. No one gets, no one person gets to dictate and gatekeep what our community is. Our community is increasingly diverse in so many different ways that one, you can't keep up. You're never gonna be able to keep up in order to keep your boxes up to date. So we have to realize and be flexible that identity is constantly shifting and everyone's in different places in their identity development. And we have to make sure that all those identities and identifiers are affirmed and supported in what we do in our campus operations. If we are, for instance, if you're looking to be a Hispanic serving institution, it doesn't mean you gotta say Hispanic for everything when you're talking about Latina and Latinx students. Hispanic is an old, outdated, racist term that doesn't capture the diversity of the Latinx community. So we have to make sure we're still using inclusive language, even when we're looking for these statuses, you know. And that's that's really like some of the biggest first steps you could take. Continuing on on that conversation, mm -hmm. provide space for community. Um, something that I am very mindful of and is not the name people are allowed and that's okay. Um, not to use that as a stereotype against us, but also allowing us to be our authentic selves and be able to be allowed, take up space and do what we need to do um, and have those kind of gestures. Um, I would don't make multiracial individuals choose one community or, over the other. Um, again, the, back to what Rick just said with checkboxes, don't make one person say, well, I'm only going to identify this way when they clearly can also identify within another way, right? Especially if our students are Latine and white or Latine and black or Afro and, and Latine, you know, there is, uh, the importance of intersectionality here is, uh, very important to be mindful of, especially with our multiracial, biracial students. When planning cultural heritage month programming, include multiracial identities into the programs and discussions. I know as someone who is Mexican identifying, uh, especially with Latinx Heritage Month, the importance of including other Latinx countries and, and the importance of Black Latinx folks. There's so many ways that we need to capture that month and that heritage. It's important to bring in those people into those kind of conversations. Um, and then create opportunities for folks to process their identities with culturally competent therapists or professionals to help them go through their personal identity development. Um, that one's not as easy to access, but if we are able to like guide people into that right direction, um, allow for that student to go into those spaces. Yeah, overall, we have a lot of work that we can do to make our spaces affirming and welcoming to our Latina and multiracial students. And our students have no problem telling us, we just need to listen. And I think that's the most important part we have to understand is, although we're the professionals in the room, you know, professionals in the room, um, our students are professionals at knowing about themselves and are really good at telling us about themselves if we just make a safe and affirming space where they feel comfortable talking to us. And if students aren't telling you what's going on, you should really reflect on why that is. Because students are always looking for administration to talk to and staff to talk to. And if you're not one of the people they're talking to, we have to really reflect on why that isn't happening. So, if y'all want to talk about this more, because we could talk about this for hours, um, feel free to email Jess or I about your questions or any preguntas you have. We're always happy to answer. Um, and, you know, you'll see us around at, you know, state board things. Um, I'm at MSSDC. Catch me at the Students of Color Conference. Um, and for you NASPA folks, we'll see y'all at the NASPA Annual Conference, too. So there's plenty of opportunity to find Jess and I around. Um, we all, we both also very active on social media, so you can find us. For sure. And then this last slide is our tools and resources. So make sure to scan this QR code. A uh, link will be included with all the items for this um, presentation. So y'all could find a bunch of different articles, books, 
and everything that we have recommended as great resources for understanding multiracial and biracial students as well as Latina students in higher education. Yeah, that's it from us. Thank you so much for watching and participating with us. Um, this is just the beginning. This is a very small snapshot of what it is to work with Latina students. Um, there's a lot of complexities in it, but I think taking the time to reflect and pause um, and to engage with these students is, is key. Um, and remember that this work is hard and that is on, it will be uncomfortable if this is not something you are currently aware of and to like make sure you work on your own feelings before you project that onto students um, and just taking that moment to breathe and pause and work through that. Peace out, y'all. Bye.